In the early 1830s in Virginia, United States, a funeral was held for a hero of the revolution, for a father and a husband, for a black man, a free man, in a country that had not yet seen emancipation and equal rights for all its citizens, and would not for several decades. He was one of countless forgotten soldiers of the revolution, the spies that helped sabotage the efforts of the powerful British army and deliver America safely into freedom's hands. Born a Virginian slave, he served as a double agent against the British, working hand-in-hand -hand with giants such as Cornwallis, Arnold, Washington, and Lafayette. His work and diligence bore fruit at the Battle of Yorktown, but when the fight for America stopped, the fight for his own life continued. From slave to spy to slave again to free man, he waged a constant war on behalf of his ideals, his country, and his personhood, and he died undefeated. But before all that, he was James Armistead Lafayette. I'm not here for the grand schemes, and now neither are you. Long history very short, this is Little Slights, where I discuss the men who lived and died in the shadows cast by history's limelight. Let's talk about a Virginian double agent. James Armistead Lafayette was born simply as James Armistead in New Kent County, Virginia, in either 1748 or 1760. The 12 year discrepancy in birth dates is unexplained, however, most sources choose the later date as the correct one, and so shall we. James was owned by one William Armistead and seemed to fill a more personal role for his master than simply working his land or his household, as he frequently accompanied him where he went but he otherwise lived a fairly typical life of a Virginia slave for the first 15 years of his life. And then, in 1775, war erupted. The 13 connected colonies that made up the bulk of British territory in North America had grown frustrated with the lack of representation of their own interests in Parliament, and what they felt was the trampling of their own self-governance by laws such as the Stamp and Declaratory Acts. Orators like Patrick Henry and Sam Adams up in Boston stirred the masses into a frenzy, while Thomas Paine chose the written word for his pulpit in his work Common Sense. As men like Thomas Jefferson and James Madison laid out the dream of a new country, as young upstarts like Alexander Hamilton and Nathan Hell sparked the flame of revolutionary furor that would see it come to fruition, led by passionate and eager, if technically unskilled generals like George Washington and Henry Knox, the colonists prepared for the fight of their lives. The fight for their freedom. But what of James Armistead? What did he think of this? After all, while these white men fought to throw off their British yokes, had they not placed collar after collar on the Native Americans, the religiously different, the female sex, and the black men and women they had bought from Africa over the years? James's home state of Virginia had always been a harsh home for African Americans, even if they were freed. For example, they had been restricted from voting by a ruling passed in 1723 by the General Assembly, in a move that even the British Crown raised an eyebrow at. Still, the rhetoric behind the revolution created a feeling of optimism in the slave population, that they might be free too. And there was a swell of support to fight in the war alongside their hopefully future fellow Americans. There were around 10 to 15 black men who had fought in the first battles of the American Revolution at Lexington and Bunker Hill in 1775, but the creation and signing of the Declaration of Independence in 1776 proved that freeing all men was not in the interest of the Continental Congress. There were nearly half a million slaves living in the Americas, and yet the word slave was not mentioned once, and slaves were prohibited from fighting in the war. It would have been all too easy for a slave to scoff at the hypocrisy, and likely many did. But James could not turn away from what he saw as the war unfolded. James Armistead was close to the fighting, closer than most of his status. His master, William Armistead, managed military supplies for the state of Virginia when war broke out, and it's very likely, though unconfirmed, that James assisted him. In 1780, several years into the war, the two moved from Williamsburg to the new capital of Richmond, Virginia, to be more available to the war efforts. Perhaps being close to those men, fighting and bargaining and dealing every day for their lives, convinced James the cause was worthy. Or perhaps it was the changes in policies that had occurred since 1776 that convinced him to ask William Armistead for permission to join the fight. 
See, the nascent states had found it difficult to fill enlistment quotas and let slaves enlist for their freedom. As early as 1777, some states enacted laws that encouraged slave owners to give their slaves to the army, either for money or in exchange for their own sons' places. Of course, the Americans were only copying what the British had been doing all along. English commanders had welcomed black slaves to their cause, and when there weren't any to welcome, they showed little hesitation in pressing them into service. A particular note on the British side was Lord Dunmore, Virginia's royal governor, who established the Ethiopian Regiment in 1775. Made up of runaway slaves, their ranks would swell to 800 under Dunmore's command until he was forced out of Virginia in 1776. The British, to many slaves, symbolized freedom just as much, if not more so, than their colonial owners. America's first black battalion was founded in 1778. Comprised of a group of Rhode Island slaves, the state provided to the army in recompense for the state's low population being unable to fill quota. They performed admirably throughout the war, noted for being sharp in both dress and maneuver by witnesses. Aside from them, almost 8,000 slaves would join the Continental Army throughout the course of the war, filling a number of key roles. James Armistead's home state of Virginia, for example, produced an unusually high number of black Navy men, nearly 150. But when James joined the Army in 1781, he found himself filling an entirely different role. James Armistead was placed under the command of Marie-Joseph Paul-Yves Roche-Guibert de Mautier, the Marquis de Lafayette. The Continental Army just kept it simply Lafayette. He was a French soldier who had been inspired by the Americans' cause and came to join the war in 1777, where he had been made a major general and forged a fast bond with General George Washington, assisting him with strategy and carrying out his orders across the 13 colonies. By 1780, Lafayette was essentially the foundation of America's fledgling alliance with France, and he had big plans to use French reinforcements to take New York and several other key locations. But Washington and French General Jean-Baptiste de Rochambeau urged patience. So, in the meantime, Lafayette spent 1780 patrolling New Jersey and New York State and wintering in Philadelphia, a job he was happy to perform, but not one that was seeing much action. In January of 1781, the tides changed. Washington ordered Lafayette to go to Virginia to join up with Baron von Steuben's troops and stem the losses caused by Benedict Arnold's defection to the British. It was likely sometime after his forces linked with von Steuben's that Lafayette was introduced to the new soldier under his command, James Armistead, slave and Virginia local, eager to serve. Lafayette had no fondness for slavery, and would later despair that he had helped found a nation built upon it, and so put James to work without bias, first as a forager and courier, then as something far more complex. Chasing after Benedict Arnold in one direction while British General Charles Cornwallis chased him in the other, what Lafayette needed most of all was intelligence. And here was a bright young man, knowledgeable of the geography of Virginia, who also happened to be black. Remember the welcome the British gave the runaway slaves in Virginia? There had never been a better time to exploit that than now, and gain the trust of Arnold and Cornwallis. James Armistead became not a soldier, not a Navy man, but a spy, one of the first African Americans to do so. The heroics of spies are unsung. One needs to look no further than the sheer volume of works on the famous generals of the war compared to the relatively small amount on Washington's Culper Ring, for example, a network of spies that worked average jobs as merchants and farmers during the day and turned over the whispers they had heard from their Tory, or British sympathizer customers, at night. But their work was critical to American success. The American army was outgunned, underfed, ill-equipped, and poorly trained. Being able to outsmart the British was the only way the colonists would ever hope to win, and to do that, they couldn't just rely on the greater knowledge of the terrain and the support of the civilian population, though that was invaluable. They had to know what the British forces were going to do before they did it. Armistead was not really part of the Culper Ring, being almost wholly Lafayette's man, but his work in Virginia was no less worthy. He went to Benedict Arnold's camp in Virginia and told them he was a runaway slave, looking for freedom from his owners with the British forces. They were, of course, leery of him at first, giving him only the most menial task to do. 
but he earned their trust by leading Benedict Arnold's forces safely through the terrain of Virginia, help the British desperately needed, and knowledge that didn't seem too strange for a runaway slave to have. Meanwhile, Arnold had been on a full-out rampage throughout Virginia, destroying mills, farms, and warehouses to cripple the American forces' supply chain. Any information James could provide to the Continental Army on Arnold's next targets would be invaluable, and he did provide, though his successes in spying were likely undermined by the arrival of British reinforcements in late spring. When Arnold was sent north in May, he left James with General Charles Cornwallis, who employed him as an orderly, someone who waited on officers at their table. That meant that almost every day, James was privy to maps, strategies, and brainstorming sessions. James was illiterate, so he had to rely on his memory to relay this information to the spies lingering around camp, who could write the information down and pass it on to Lafayette. His competence must have impressed Cornwallis as well. After some time, the general looked at this smart, unassuming man, able to blend into the environment, and decided to promote him to double agent. He tasked James with spying on American forces and reporting back their moves to him. It was everything James and Lafayette could have wanted, and more. The Americans sent him to British camps, where he wandered through the maze of tents and soldiers, listening in on their plans and reading their maps while they paid him no mind, until he reached the commander in charge and fed them false information supplied by his fellow spies. And then, smooth as you please, James took all the valuable information he had gathered and delivered it to the Virginia network of spies, who would place it in the hands of their superiors. On one occasion, he quote-unquote stumbled across a letter from Lafayette detailing the reinforcements the French general was about to receive, which discouraged Cornwallis from attacking. The letter was, of course, entirely fake. There was no doubt a casual, ignorant arrogance at play on Arnold and Cornwallis's part. Believing this runaway slave to be wholly theirs, so eager to help the British and earn his freedom that he would never lie or be swayed, but that only underscores how skilled James really was, a consummate actor and liar able to identify and manipulate bias and perception to gain trust and information without suspicion. He floated freely through British and American camps for the next several months, storing secrets and plans. But as the summer of 81 drew closer, the stakes grew higher. The British were fighting on foreign land, flagging, and if ever there was a time to seize the moment and force a surrender, it was now. Cornwallis and fellow General Henry Clinton, who was stationed up in New York, were constantly corresponding on how to handle their southern campaign— Cornwallis fending off the encroaching French navy from the sea and colonial army from the land. Their every whisper to each other was a matter of paramount importance to Continental Generals Washington and Lafayette. But although they had sent a barrage of spies into Cornwallis's camp, none were very effective at getting information. None but James Armistead. Being a spy, the details of what exactly James was able to relay to the Americans are quite obscure. But there is evidence that throughout the summer, Lafayette received reports compiled from James's information detailing Cornwallis's intention to travel to Portsmouth, Virginia. That might have been what led to the near month of marching and countermarching between the two opposing armies of Cornwallis and Lafayette as the British general made his way to the sea. Lafayette was not able to deter or defeat Cornwallis, and in fact nearly fell into a trap the British laid at the Green Spring Plantation in Virginia. Spy work can only do so much against thousands of troops on the ground, after all. The trap was instead sprung by Brigadier General Anthony Wayne, and the ensuing Battle of Greenspring would earn Wayne the moniker Mad for his truly audacious charge against the British forces that allowed the Americans to retreat. But a retreat meant that Cornwallis was able to proceed. He reached Portsmouth. And unbeknownst to all, the final fight of the Revolution had just begun. Cornwallis's orders had changed. He was now being ordered by Clinton to establish a fortified naval station there in Virginia. Cornwallis's choice of location for the station? The port at Yorktown. The Battle of Yorktown would be the site of Cornwallis's defeat and, ultimately, British surrender. 
Using the French Navy and American reinforcements, Generals Washington, Lafayette, Knox, Rochambeau, and many others were able to bombard British troops into defeat. Their actions, and the actions of the 15,000 men under them, were scrappy, ingenious, and heroic, and have since been memorialized in songs, monuments, and paintings to be celebrated by the nation they helped create. But there was supposedly a moment, before the fighting truly began, that it could have all been lost. James Armistead was doing his duty, serving British officers, gathering information, reporting to Cornwallis, when he discovered some stunning, horrifying plans. Cornwallis had asked to have 10,000 British troops move to reinforce Yorktown, and his request had been granted. The troops were on their way. If they arrived, Cornwallis's already substantial force would be bolstered to one that would match, if not surpass, the approaching Continental Army. And while French allies would have likely still helped America secure victory, more British troops would have meant that Cornwallis could have held the outer defenses and redoubts surrounding Yorktown for much longer, leading to a greater, more perilous engagement that would kill dozens and draw the siege out for weeks longer. The spy informed Lafayette of these plans, and together with Washington, they were able to devise a blockade for the incoming reinforcements, preventing them from ever truly joining up with Cornwallis's forces. The siege of Yorktown began on September 28, 1781. On October 17, the British sent a drummer to wave the white flag. On October 19, British General Charles O'Hara presented his sword to the Continental Army. The siege, and for all intents and purposes, the war, was won, though the Treaty of Paris would not be signed for two more years. To add extra salt to the wound, soon after his surrender, Cornwallis would visit Lafayette at his tents, and there he would see his own servant and spy, James Armistead, at his side. It was a world turned upside down, and James Armistead had helped shift the axis. His actions, the Marquis de Lafayette would later say, were instrumental in the victory at Yorktown. His dedication, beyond comparison. His cunning, his know-how, his bravery had saved thousands. Armistead was a hero. A hero who was thrown no parades, given no compensation, and, when the fighting was done, was returned to his owner, William Armistead, to resume his life as a slave. Due to conditions set during the war, James should have been given his freedom, but a new law enacted in 1783 had changed, or rather clarified, the parameters. Under this ruling, only slave soldiers were eligible for emancipation. James Armistead was the slave spy. James fought against this, hard and with the support of William Armistead, but due to inadequate paperwork and a healthy dose of pure stubbornness, the Virginia legislature refused to listen to him despite repeated petitions. When Lafayette returned to Virginia in 1784, he was dismayed to find James still a slave, and wrote a testimonial to be presented to the legislature on James's behalf. The letter read, This is to certify that the bearer by the name of James has done essential services to me while I had the honor to command in this state. His intelligences from the enemy's camp were industriously collected and faithfully delivered. He perfectly acquitted himself with some important commissions I gave him, and appears to me entitled to every reward his situation can admit of. Done under my hand, Richmond, November 21st, 1784, Lafayette. A simple explanation for what James had done, maybe, but it did the trick. By 1786, William Armistead had become a member of the House of Delegates for Virginia, and between his position, Lafayette's words, and James's tenacity, the Virginia Assembly finally granted James Armistead's petition for his freedom on January 9, 1787. One of his first acts as a free man? To add the name Lafayette to his own, in honor of his general. The two men, however, would not see each other for the next 37 years. In 1824, the Marquis de Lafayette, having survived the French Revolution and Napoleon's wars, came back to tour the country that had once so warmly adopted him at the invitation of then-President James Monroe. He passed through many locations, greeted as a hero at each one, including his stop at Richmond, Virginia. But something different happened there. As Lafayette looked upon the crowd, he saw somebody familiar— the echo of a young spy in the face of a 64-year-old man. The old French general demanded they stop his carriage and leapt down into the crowd, rushing to James Armistead Lafayette to embrace him. 
Forty years melted away, leaving two soldiers, brothers in arms who helped save a nation that was never their own. Reunited again, and for the last time. After greeting each other, perhaps sharing a memory or two and words of thanks, the two separated once more. Lafayette returned to his tour, James, to the life he had built. It's incredible what a difference a man can make in just a few short months. From January of 1781 to September of that same year, James Armistead Lafayette had helped change the tide of a war that established a country, albeit in small, invisible ways. He spent longer fighting for his own freedom than he ever did America's, and in the end, both man and country settled down to figure out the future and make something of themselves. America would go on to become a powerhouse on the North American continent, ostensibly fostered on the principles of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. James, for his part, embodied those principles pretty well for a man that America had refused to count as one of their own. He got married, had one son and several daughters, bought a farm, amassed a small fortune, and made a small but happy living for himself. James Armistead Lafayette died in 1830 or 1832 in Virginia. In the words of John Salmon, then head of state records for the Virginia State Library, spoken in 1981, James's victory was a victory that subjected the institution of slavery to the relentless contagion of liberty that had prodded America to honor the fullest implication of its professed belief that all men are created equal. James Armistead Lafayette's legacy is one of a spy in the South, of the future of a nation hanging on a few words, of freedom and what it means to fight for it against enemies and allies alike. It's a quiet legacy, one that doesn't get songs or monuments or paintings, but it endures in the country it helped create. <laughs> 